All right, I am joined today by Chris Spielman. You know, I was thinking of what title to give you, and you have so many <laughs> things that you do in life, it's hard to say. You know, former NFL player, of course everyone knows you from Ohio State, and cancer warrior, I mean an advocate for research and everything, and now author, your newest title. And the book just came out called That's Why I'm Here, the Chris and Stephanie Spielman story. And That's Why I'm Here, obviously, has a lot of meaning in your life. But it came up very naturally but from Stephanie first, right? Can you kind of tell us about that story? Well, sure. Uh, I, one of the reasons for the title is uh, for being your wedding vows when you get married and things happen. What are you going to do? Well, are you going to stay and help? And yes, that's why I'm here, to do that. That's what we do when we take our wedding vows. But the, the main inspiration comes from a young lady who met Steph at a different function outside in the lobby, and they just found themselves alone. And this young lady was recently diagnosed. She t approached Stephanie, told Steph about it, and Stephanie kind of asked gently about her doctors, her research, her, her plan, her family, how's everybody doing, asked her about her upcoming surgery. And when they got done chatting, the lady um, kind of apologized and felt bad because maybe she felt like she was putting this extra burden on Steph. Then Steph looked at her and gently touched her and said, don't you understand, that's why I'm here. Then the young lady then went on to explain that she felt uh, very calm as she approached her upcoming surgery and her upcoming battle. And so for me, I, I think that was the ideal title. Uh, I read that in a letter to the editor, actually, where the young lady explained this to uh, the public and one, two days after Stephanie's funeral. So it kind of gave me a, a hope and inspiration and it let me know that her death was not for nothing. Right. Now, I was just sharing with you that I'm a breast cancer survivor myself, and before I read the book, which I just finished yesterday and was amazing, I, I knew to prepare myself for emotions, for you know things that, that would be tough to, to read because I went through it. But it's not just me that has had this you know, reaction to your book. I mean, everybody that's read it is, is moved and inspired, and there's just new things I think that people maybe appreciate because of what you shared about it. Well, I think sometimes people uh, look at me, as you described, as a former NFL player and a Ohio State Buckeye, uh, somebody who's on TV and works for ESPN and has a great job sitting on a 50-yard line. Uh, I wrote the book when I found out that Stephanie was terminal because you begin to reflect on your life and you reflect on your cancer journey. And when you do that, everything is very clear. So the book, book is very raw. Um, I'm honest about the mistakes. I was a broken man, I was a humbled man, and people relate to that because when you go through the experience that I went through, that you've gone through, sometimes you feel like you're alone. And there's fears that you wanna share and triumphs that you wanna share, and that's what I try to do from our perspective. Now I know too, you said you started to write the book when you found out she was terminal. Did you guys discuss a lot about the book, about writing it, was she, you know, for you doing this? Well, she was, a, I think, a very good writer. And yes, we discussed doing a book at some point in time, but um, she knew I was going to do this. Uh, she trusted that uh, I would get the story out there. And it's kind of a story behind a story. Obviously, our, our story has been public for a very long time, but it's a little bit of football. It's a little bit of um, a love story. And I think it's, uh, it's about two people sharing a journey together that never lost hope. Hope through an original diagnosis, hope through five recurrences, and even hope in death. Hope that is not a, a wish, but hope that is a promise defined by our faith. Now I know, yeah, faith was a big part of your entire journey. You talk about that a lot, you quote the Bible a lot. Yeah. And that's something too that I love that when your kids would feel like maybe they weren't having a great day, you would write a verse on their arm or a message on their arm are you still doing that? It depends. Um, <laughs> you know, everybody out there has a story. You have a story. There's people that are watching us that have a story and challenges in their life. Uh, this is how we choose to get through our challenges. Uh, my one daughter had a very difficult time with me traveling uh, for work, and she had a tremendous fear that I was going to die in an airplane. And this was obviously after losing her mother, I think, that certainly was related. So what I used to do it's just right that I love you, and I wrote little comfort verses on her hand and an arm with a Sharpie. Now, she looked like she could star in L.A. Inc., of course, <laughs> but, you know, it seemed to work. And the other thing I would do to help them cope is, like, whatever deodorant I was using or 
soap or whatever, I would put it a little bit on her hands so she can smell me while I was, I was gone. I, you just learn how to deal with different things and, and do the best that you can. Uh, you know, there are challenges still, and there always will be challenges, but we choose to uh, celebrate Stephanie's life as opposed to mourn her life. And in a videotape that she made when she was healthy for the kids, uh, she made, uh, she looked into the camera and she said, never use my death as an excuse for anything, but motivation for everything. And for the most part, my children do that, and I do that. Yeah, she left you with a, a legacy and a lot of wise wisdom. Well, she did, and, uh, <laughs> but I left her with a promise. Uh, the last conversation we had, I told her I'd be the best dad that I could be and that I would uh, continue her legacy. And, you know, most of my day is, is taken up by dealing with uh, this dreaded disease and fighting this dreaded disease, uh, whether with social networking, I, I am in contact with survivors or caregivers. I hear 10 or 12 different stories every single day. And uh, I just share experiences or whatever advice I have, or sometimes people give me advice. And so it helps me um, uh, continue what her legacy is, and that was fighting cancer. And of course, we had a Stephanie Spielman Fund that's raised over $10 million. And, and all that money goes directly to research, none to overhead. That's something that she was very proud of, and I am very proud of today. I know that was one thing that I, I noticed because when you go through and you know look at all the scholarships or look at all the things and funds and, and things, people always kind of say, well, where is this money going to? Right. Where are we seeing this research? And I think until you're on the other side of it, though, you had said, Stephanie, there were drugs during the fourth time that right. she had found out she had cancer that weren't there the first time. And it may not be the fact that we're curing cancer, but one day at a time making people's lives a better quality, yeah. you know, maybe working towards that is the hope. Well, in the cancer world, I think in, in some of the research, if you get uh, a result that says, okay, this studies have shown that it's prolonged somebody's life by a month or two months. Well, right. 10 years from now, that's going to be instead of a month or two months, that's going to be 10 years or 20 years. And the one thing that, uh, that I'm adamant about and the people that help me oversee the fund is, is this, and I think people uh, can take rest into this. I hold uh, the, the researchers accountable. For example, they'll receive a certain amount of money for their lab or for their research project. On an annual or biannual review, if they are not showing results, they are out and somebody else is in. Uh, and I want people to understand that, that their money's not being wasted or thrown away. Right. Uh, it's being used, and it's being used on researchers who are showing progress, who have great new ideas. Cancer is, as you know, it's, it's evil, it's proactive, it hides, it cheats. So we have to attack this disease, in my opinion, with a sense of urgency. And that's what we try to do with the Stephanie Spielman Fund. And I know um, your oldest daughter started writing a blog, oh. even. She's kind of taken up the cause and been with you in a lot of the speaking engagements and stuff, right? Um, yeah. You, I mean, our kids deal with things different ways. And um, Maddie is a wonderful writer. And at first, I think she tried to, she kind of suppressed all the feelings and all the sadness and was kind of walking around in a daze for a long time. And I never wanted my kids to be forced into this fundraising world or into the cancer world because, as you know, it can be overwhelming. I mean, everywhere you go, there's a pink ribbon or there's a pink this or a pink that. You say, okay, enough of the pink for right. a second. <laughs> I mean, and, and it's all good. Don't get, don't get, right. don't get me wrong. I mean, we're driving down 315, and we see the Stephanie Spielman Comprehensive Breast Center building that's uh, up on Olin Tangi and Third Avenue, and it's wonderful. But it's always there. It's always right. there for them. So what she had to do was make a choice: Am I going to deal with this head on, or am I going to am I going to keep kind of suppressing it? Well, she chose to deal with it head on, and I think it's been a benefit to her and a benefit to others. Um, we have a platform. We didn't ask for the platform. I don't want the pla I don't want to be a breast cancer spokesperson. I don't want to do it. I, who wants that job? Do you want it? <laughs> no. You don't want it? Nobody wants it, right? But, I'm a walking platform, but, but, too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what happens, right? But since right? we have it, what are we going to do with it? We're going right. to be the very best that we can because we see that we can have a direct impact on people's lives in a positive way because for whatever reason, in my opinion, God has given us this platform to make a difference and to provide hope. When I uh, look at you, you're young and beautiful and you're a breast cancer survivor, so people watching you are seeing hope. Yeah, and I, yeah, and, and the one thing, and I wanted to ask you this because I, I thought of this reading the book a lot of times, is 
my now husband who was with me during that, I always thought it was harder for him, harder for my family, tougher for everybody I knew to deal with what I was going through than it was myself. Because my only choice was to beat it. Yeah. You know, I thought this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get from A to B. I'm going to, you know, kick its butt, so to speak, and then we're going to be on the other side of this. Yeah. And a lot of times it was a helpless feeling, being a, you know, the husband of somebody sure. going through it. And and I think, you know, in you writing the book, was that in itself a whole different side of therapy for you um. to deal with it? I mean. N no, <laughs> no, think, no. I, there's no therapy for it? me. No. Yeah. But no, it was first of all, there's there's choices that you make, and as a husband and a father, uh, it is my belief that instinctively you want to protect your wife and your children right. from harm. And I was originally uh, mad at myself and very angry, and I felt like I let my wife and my children down. Now I know that it's it's not a realistic thought, but. Right. You know, men tend to have egos, and <laughs> we're going to rise bit, up and right. protect our, our our family. I mean, that's built into us. And once I realize that I can't out hit it, I can't outwork it, I can't out uh, lift it, I can't outsmart it, uh, and humble yourself to it, and understand that eventually you got to give control. For me, I gave control to God to guide me and lead me and I humbled myself and the only thing then I can become was a supporter and once I realized that I can become a supporter and that I can't control the situation I was a better teammate for my wife and my children. You had to get through the acceptance of where you stood and what you could do to help. To well I knew what I had to do it's just I had to I had to because of my ego I had to forgive myself because I couldn't beat cancer or that I didn't have the I, I know it's a, a little bit of a, a saying that people have, oh, give me the cancer instead of my wife. Well, right. I tried that. I tried that deal. That didn't work. I was cutting deals left and right, and right. none of the deals worked until I kind of used a bad word in today's society, but I certainly did it, was submit to the situation and submit to a higher power and let that power guide me and lead me, and, and obviously my faith was that power. Right. Well, yeah, I know you said there was one point, a, a kind of a changing moment when you curled up in a ball and just yeah. thought, I'm done making deals. Well, I, I was done. I mean, you know, because we all, you in your 20s or Steph and I at 30 and 31 years old, you have a feeling of invincibility that how can this happen? Right. Well, you know, this I'm, I'm going to fix this because I'm young and I'm strong and I'm smart and I'm tough and we'll, we'll beat this. Well, when it keeps coming back and all of a sudden you thought you had a deal, that deal doesn't work out. Eventually, for me, what came to me was understanding God's grace was sufficient and that my God's power would be made perfect in my weakness. So I started waking up every morning and at that moment asking and praying to become the weakest man in the world. When I was able to do that, by saying that, I then became the strongest man in the world to be able to deal with anything, and I had a certain peace that transcends all understanding about the situation. Right. Now, I know in this, um, the 19th is the day that Stephanie passed away, and this year the Coleman Race for a Cure, which was very close to her. Um, I know the, the time she went through the finish line yeah. and Maddie helped her walk out of her wheelchair. Um, is just kind of an iconic moment in her life, I'm sure. And it's on the 19th this year, the race. I mean, is that kind of uh, going to be a very special day for you, a hard day for you? No, not really, because um, I, I think when you, when you look at it, Mother's Day is, is difficult at times and right. it's for, for my children. But again, uh, on our way to the cemetery, it's a little solemn. On the way home, it's happy because of our choice to celebrate. And in Stephanie's last days, uh, you pray for mercy and a healing, and then, then pretty soon when you get to a certain point, you, you start praying for mercy and death because of the situation and the condition that she was in. So I understand where she is now. And so all these dates and stuff, yeah, mm -hmm. I think they're all first, but once you get through the first, they're just another day and it's just another pink ribbon and it's just another uh, punch to the face of cancer and raising money for research and prevention and anything that we can do to knock out this dreaded disease. 
All right. Well, I thank you for being so open and sharing with us. And of course, uh, that's why I'm here. The Chris and Stephanie Spielman story is in bookstores now, so you can go get it. Get your Kleenex ready before <laughs> you read it, I promise. And uh, we will put more of the information on our website, NBC4I.com.